Dun, 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 dun. And we are live. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Forest Skills Lesson 10. Um, this is amazing. We've got we've done 10 lessons live already, and this one is on how to survive. So that seems quite a broad subject, really, doesn't it? Um, I was asking on Instagram and Facebook um, last night and again this morning um, for people who, uh, for ideas for this lesson. I was going to do survival hacks, and um, it was actually Ben Fogel that um, wrote back saying, um, Ed, could you sort of uh, do a bit of how to survive lockdown, how to stop yourself losing your mind? And um, I was a little bit flippant in my reply to uh, old Benjamin. Um, he, uh, in the past, has been very kind to me. Re weirdly, um, I was having a little wobble, um, crikey, about six, seven years ago. And I did a talk at the RGS, and he could tell that I was struggling. And at the end, he, uh, I went, I, I went uh, uh, he came up to me, and um, he said, um, Ed, Marina really ne needs to cook you a good meal. And so, really randomly, I end up going to Ben Fogel's house and <laughs> have a meal cooked by his wife, which was uh, really sweet. Um, so, anyway, this... Um, this lesson is what it is because Ben Fogel um, suggested, uh, whether seriously or not, um, I do a little session on, um, on how to survive. Um, so, as ever, let's just do a few little shout outs first and um, see who we've got with us this morning. Um, Preacher Bear, as ever, first person to comment. Um, hello, mate, how are you? Um, <coughs> He's had his porridge, which is great. Um, <coughs> as Preacher Bear is, caught, is, is um, Tom and Colette in Cornwall, it would appear. Hello to them. Weight Loss Panda, morning everyone again. Um, the Ruddler, good morning all. Michael says good morning again from the Netherlands. <coughs> We've got lots of good mornings. Uh, Finding HD says morning from Germany, Germany and the Netherlands tuning in. Morning from Casper um, with a thumbs up. Thank good morning, Casper. How are you, mate? Um, Dennis again from Germany. Incredible. Um, Abdullah from London. Abdullah, Mariam, oh, yeah, Mariam and Khadija from London. Um, Alicia from Northamptonshire. Hi, Alicia. Um, Evil Orkai from South Wales. Hello, mate. Um, Ava, oh, this is going fast. Um, hello from Life in Aberdeenshire. Um, Weight Loss Panda, morning from Maria and Jim. Hello, guys. Uh, Joe says, morning, mate. Peter Ward says, morning here again from Primrose from Norfolk. Oh, with his daughter Primrose from Norfolk. Hi Primrose, how are you this morning? Um, Kay and Mutsumi in Japan, say hello. <coughs> Neil Smith, is that the Neil Smith that I know? We dropped everything to watch this. Running shoes on, but looking forward to motivation before I head out on the road. Well mate, hopefully it's worth, worth pausing your run for. We'll do a few more shout outs a bit later, but um, Thank you very much for joining me. I'm uh, slightly zoomed in uh, this morning on me because I get pins and needles in my legs and so kneeling was um, destroying me. But in a little minute, I'm going to um, zoom out and do a little hand drill demonstration. Um, as ever, like to do things live that could go wrong. Um, so if you do have a hand drill set and you've uh, had it for a while and you, um, and you haven't got an ember with it, then then Keep watching because I'm going to go through what I think um, can go wrong with a hand drill and um, and how to actually combat that and how to get an ember. But two bits of wood, it's not got the mechanical advantages of the bow drill, which has got the big bow. Two bits of wood, one spin in the other with your hands. Can you get a fire to go? Well, let's see. I did this morning, but you never know. Live, everything's different really, isn't it? Okay, so... Today's lesson, or today's session, um, and I'd love you to send in comments throughout the whole thing, and I'll try and pause and try and make this as interactive as possible, is on how to survive. Now, I think survival situations, they're, they're not unrealistic. Like, so I'm not talking about, again, preparing for doomsday or having a plane crash or something like that. I think the reason that I think survival situations and learning things about survival and bushcraft is important is because it is transferable to everyday life. And so 
So the skills that I think I've learned through um, adventures and through survival things, I think are extraordinarily applicable, especially when we're going through something as horrific as lockdown, you know, um, when um, all our social um, life has been completely disrupted, a lot of our financial stability has been disrupted, um, our whole life is, is kind of turned on its head at the moment. And a lot of people are very bored and a lot of people are waiting for it to end. And, um, and at the end of the day, I think that there are some tips and tricks that I think that will be applicable that I've learned along the way in terms of walking the Amazon, in terms of isolation on Olorua for 60 days that could help. Now, the, I'm going to split it down into initially four sections. The four survival priorities are water, food, fire and shelter. OK, they're the basics that you need to survive. And I would use the word survive there because you still do need a huge amount of things on top of those in order to thrive or have a normal life or enjoy yourself. Um, I did a um, survival experiment with my wife and my little boy who was at the time um, 18 months old, I think. And we went on an island. One of the big extrapolations at the end of the month um, was, yes, we could live here, but we really, really wouldn't want to. And that was because, obviously, we didn't have a community around us. We didn't have any social connections. You know, we were, it, we were with the people we loved the most in the world, as everyone is on lockdown, but we, didn't, we weren't happy. Um, and I think that's why this period is so difficult for everyone. It's, it's all well and good to be with your wife, who you love dearly, but after a while, she's going to get really annoying. And um, I'll be the first to admit that we've had big rows in this house, um, sometimes in front of the children, which I'm not proud of, you know? And I think everyone needs to be honest and everyone needs to be kind with themselves, really. Um, I think, you know, the idea that anyone is going through this without struggling a little bit mentally, without allowing their frustrations to be projected onto their partners and stuff like that is unrealistic. And I think we all need to be a, a little bit kind to ourselves because it's stressful, because we don't know the outcome you can't be 100% relaxed with it because we don't know what the travel situation will be like in May or what our bank balance will be like in November and we've got a mortgage to pay and a family to look after and all those sort of things. It's very, 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 very difficult to be 100% um, uh, calm and uh, composed and happy because um, there's so many unknowns. Um, I'm going to go through the survival priorities. They're less relevant to lockdown, but I think it was, is appropriate in a, in a lesson on, on um, how to survive. First one's water. Now, water is a little bit of a dry subject, excuse the pun, but um, it's boring, isn't it? It comes out of the tap. You know, who cares about water? Um, also, I thought, until I did an experiment, 60 days on Olorua, and then I realised... You can't do anything if you've got, not got water. So water is obviously, from a physical perspective, the number one survival priority, as in you need to drink within those three, first three days, probably, to actually physically survive. But it is so important that psychologically you can't do anything else. So in the period where it hadn't rained and I um, got onto the island and I was using coconut water in order to hydrate myself, I couldn't focus on how to light a fire. I literally couldn't focus on anything. I tried to make a grass skirt and it was awful because all I could think about was water. And I think it's very difficult to understand just how critical it is because of the fact we have it and we take it for granted all the time. So therefore, um, just as a little um, fun game, I want you to um, task after this lesson is to make a cup of tea without using water that's come out of the tap. So um, we're going to make this safe, 100% safe um, by um, by saying, okay, we're going to go to, you're going to go to either a little stream, or you can even take puddle water, and I want you to boil that water. Um, if it's got sediment in it, I want you to filter it. We did a lesson, I can't remember which lesson it was, I think it was lesson two, survival hacks, which um, I took, which was how to make a water filter. Filter the water first, take out any big sediment particles, or do it through, um, or do it for a t-shirt to strain out big um, particles, and then boil it. And if you've got a rolling boil, um, then you can make a cup of tea out of that. And I think it's important to understand where water comes from. It just isn't this commodity that somebody else provides and puts chlorine in. And I think going through those steps will help appreciate the, um, the, the importance of water and, and think about things like the purity of it. And, and if so, if you have got any streams nearby, then go and do that. If you've got a little puddle, and I'm not, I'm not being um, ridiculous, I've drank puddle water on many, many occasions because 
because it's water and as long as you filter it and as long as you boil it and i would advocate both of those two 100 percent you can't just go around sipping out of puddles unless you're a dog or something like that when you've got lots of immunities built up but i think that's a little task is go and try and have a drink using water that didn't come out of the tap um the second one is food now i think um from a survival perspective in the uk these days it, it would be tricky to completely survive um, if without breaking the law off the land. We just don't have enough common land. We don't have enough um, uh, variety of, um, well, there's not enough wild animals for a start to go around. Um, there's certainly all of the big game um, is gone pretty much. And, and so that would be difficult. And so I suppose when, uh, when I talk about food, um, it isn't one of the survival priorities that in an in a immediate survival scenario is important. You can go quite a few days without food, quite a few weeks even without food. Um, you will obviously deplete an energy massively, um, but it is possible. You click into this survival mode, your body starts burning the fats and proteins in order to help you get through. And it's actually, you know, very... Um, documented now that it's actually a really good state to be in. If you're, if you're hungry and you're um, burning, you're in, in ketosis basically, it's a really, really healthy state. It allows your brain to function well, which means that if you go back years, um, if you were hunting and you were hungry, you would have still had the alertness to be able to hunt um, professionally and well um, and actually catch the animal and actually stand a chance rather than be this bumbling idiot who can't think about anything because he's hungry. Um, which is the state that we often find ourselves in. So I think, again, <clears throat> for me, I've, gone, I, I, I've learned so many things about so many different diets over the years. I know too much about food, I think, um, and often I think that's the problem. We think too much about it. And our problem is probably the fact that we eat too much, if I'm, if I'm honest. And, and that's probably, in terms of a lockdown um, analysis, probably more people are eating more rubbish food. Um, and I know there were some people who have gone on health kicks, but a lot of them have broken down in recent months too because having the motivation to carry those through is very, very tricky. So I would just say eat whole, whole foods. Eat, um, don't eat processed foods. Don't eat um, lots, lots of stuff that comes in a packet or anything like that. Eat whole foods um, and then don't think about it too much. Um, I don't think you should be obsessed with extraordinarily low body fat. If you take somebody who is on the face of it extraordinarily healthy like Ross Edgeley, um, if you look back to the Falklands War when we went down to this extremely cold environment, the very first people to go down with hypothermia were the PTIs, the physical training instructors, and that was because they had low body fat. So body fat is being ostracized um, you know, in the world today, and every female is meant to have abs as well, which is an extraordinarily low level of body fat for a woman. And I'm not saying that all of these um, fitness models and everything aren't healthy. They probably are extraordinarily healthy, but you don't, every, everybody does not need to look like that. And I personally feel like a bit, of, a bit of fat on your body is not only normal, not only attractive, but also leaves you in a far more physically robust state, especially when it's cold like this. We all need a little bit of fat on our body. And it does therefore mean that we're not as reliant on that next um, intake of food to get our next energy because we've got lots of fat stores. Okay, fire. Um, Fire is, for me, what I consider to be the difference between surviving and thriving. If you're out in the wild and you're, as I have been, huddled in a cave, cold, the wind's blowing in, it's dark, you feel miserable. Um, you, haven't got, um, you haven't got a source of morale. And obviously fire can heat you at night, there's light at night, it can cook your food, it can boil your water to purify everything. But um, for me, the psychological boost is the biggest thing. Um, to know that you're winning, to know that you've done something that no animal on the planet has a capability of doing, um, that for me is key. And I'm just going to zoom the camera out and do a little fire demonstration so that this isn't just me talking all the time so that you've got a little bit of physical, um, physical tuition. And if I fail, that'll be quite funny as well. Let's see if there's any comments. Uh, before um, we can't hear you, Ed. We can't hear you. Wait, honesty there, Ed. What's the most important? Do do do. Okay, you can hear me now, can't you? Yes, good. We keep chickens and rabbits for food. Yeah, we keep chickens um, and pigs actually. Um, but um, yeah, no, I know I I am an omnivore. I am I do eat meat and uh, and yeah, I think um, I don't think I don't see any problem with that as long as you are treating them well and looking after them well. Um, morning, Ed. Love the live shows. Um, <clears throat> that's from Ed Tilston, actually. Um, 
Ben in Staffordshire saying hello. Weight loss panda. Anything needed today? No, there's nothing needed. Um, I'm just going to do a little demonstration now um, on the hand drill. And um, <clears throat> hand drill, again, is one step beyond the um, bow drill in terms of its um, difficulties. It's not the most straightforward thing to grasp. And yet, again, it's obviously not impossible. A um, couple of little tips. Same tender bundle. This is just actually the backup one that I had for my fire demonstration um, the other day when I was doing the bow drill. So we want very, very dry grass and fine grass in the middle. So the little bit in the middle, I've literally worked this grass to, to break all of the fibers to make it as fine as possible, placing that in the middle. And then um, these two materials, very, 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 very uh, sourceable in the UK. Um, the half board, um, and I went into this in detail in the bow drill lesson, but I'll, I'll go into this in more detail on Friday when I do a session on completely on fire and, 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 and actually the hand drill. Halfboard clematis or clematis, depends how you say it, and the um, drill is elder. So elder, you, you'll see a lot of shoots and you want the relatively new shoots um, that are springing up and that aren't, haven't got too thick. But the nice thing about elder is it has a pithy core, but a hard, um, a hard outer and it grows very, very straight. Um, um, and then, then again, for the same as the um, bow drill that I did the lesson for the other day, um, you have to make a, you have to burn in a, a um, you have to seat the drill, burn that in, and then carve your ember notch, which again is an eighth of a circle. I'm just gonna have a little play at this, and if it works, then great. If it doesn't, have a good laugh at me. And um, one of the top tips I would use is wash your hands, first of all, I did that before the lesson, but then spit on your hands just before you're about to drill, and then wait till it's really nice and tacky, and then put, pick the drill up. Okay, and the method that I'm using is called the floating hand drill. I'm going backwards and forwards with my hands, and I'm just tilting them so they stay in one place, and already there's smoke building up around the base. Now, the trick here is to maintain this for quite a long time. So you can see that I'm talking to you and I'm just creating smoke. I'll have to stop talking in a second because I won't have the energy. And you're just building up powder in the ember notch. And then I'm gonna increase the strength a little bit and I'm gonna stop talking. Okay, one little downwards bell. And then again, you've got an ember if there's a thin wisp of smoke coming off it, and indeed there is. So, gently, this ember's gonna be smaller than your bow drill ember. So gently tease it away from the hearth board. Again, no rush here to transfer it into your tinder bundle. The longer that you um, leave it to transfer it, the more it will establish, up until a couple of minutes anyway. So I'm going to put this right in the centre of the tinder bundle. I'm then going to, again, depress with my thumbs and then pinch it to try and get that right in the middle. Don't do this indoors. And as I said, it doesn't always work. So you can see that, go to absolutely so close. See if I can get it back.
Okay, there you go. Live. <laughs> Doesn't always work. Sometimes you just get it a bit long, wrong. That was um, a lovely ember. Transferred it to Tinder Bundle. Hardest part done. And um, I think you have to start evaluating, okay, was the, um, was the hay a little bit damp because it's been down in the cellar all night? Why was it not going from combustion? Was I thinking too much about what I was going to do next? And not waiting for the, um, you know, not blowing slowly enough. Um, all sorts of things going on there. But, um, you know, it's live and we didn't get flames there. But um, that is the nature of the beast. Right, let's zoom in again. Let's see if we've got any comments there. If you can steam it in the smoke. <laughs> Okay, Tinder turned out too damp. Yeah, no, it probably was too damp, Tim, but I think I should have put it up on a radiator or something upstairs before the lesson. But you know. Morning, I just discovered your series by binge watching on Discovery. Thank you, mate, that's Big Grizzly Outdoors. Boom, we have fire. Well, we didn't quite, did we? We didn't quite blow the ember into flames, which is, you know what? It's all about honesty, isn't it? <laughs> Um, do 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 Warhol, congrats on the ember from from Michael. Still better than I do from Weight Loss Panda. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Um, all right, let's sit back. Um, so that was that was a little chat about fire, and then shelter's the last one. <laughs> you cannot even see in here. I would say, obviously, if you're doing fire and you're uh, and you are trying to get it, don't do it indoors. I'm, I'm in a basement which has got, which has got solid uh, floors, no soft furnishings, and a big bucket of water right beside me, which I um, have got. <laughs> but obviously, it's, um, it is something that you don't want to do indoors, so not advocating that at all. This is literally just for demonstration purposes. <laughs> um, okay, shelter. Um, <clears throat> For me, the, the obvious thing about shelter being the last survival priority is the fact that um, is the fact that um, you've got to get out of the elements, haven't you? And, and therefore, it's um, that is that is something that you can't dispute at all. But I would say that it's also um, extraordinarily important from a from a um, from a safety perspective um, and and from feeling safe. Um, what I've found quite often in survival scenarios when I'm um, when I am um, <laughs> Can you even see me? There's smoke in the way of the camera, isn't there? Um, what I often find in survival scenarios is that I feel so safe in whatever shelter I build or when I'm in a cave or something, and I always want to retreat to there. And so having somewhere, having somewhere which is your space that you can retreat to is, from a psychological perspective, really, really important. And again, it's another reason why being homeless is such a difficult thing, um, because you literally don't have a front door. You don't have anywhere to shut and shut the world out. Um, you don't have that. And I did 60 days... Um, Sleeping Rough um, for a Channel 4 series um, two years ago now. And um, yeah, that was one of the biggest things I found, like say something like New Year's Eve, where everyone spills out into the street. Well, that's your home. And suddenly you're invaded for the night and you have to go along with whatever is going on in the street and you don't have that, that little safe space. That, um... <laughs> I'm just going to open the door so that we clear the smoke a little bit. Do, 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 do. Mm -hmm. It's atmospheric, okay? It is atmospheric. Right, I want to now go into a bit more about um, what I think is an umbrella that... that um, <laughs> you've got to open another door, Stafford. Do-do-do. Ah. What I think is, I suppose, an umbrella that... Oh, we, can't, we can't have that, can we? That's, you can't even see me. That's ridiculous. Right, bear with me one minute. Do, 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 do. See, would you get any of this excitement if this wasn't live? No, you wouldn't. That's why this is priceless, priceless entertainment. <laughs> Okay, let's come a bit closer to the camera and then you might be able to see me a little bit more. 
Right, that's the dogs coming down now. <laughs> One second. Okay. <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about the psychology of survival, and I want to go first into the psychology, but also into what I consider to be a little bit more than um, psychology, which is, which is mindfulness. And psychology, I suppose, is the term that you would originally use if you were talking about dealing with your current state, like dealing with your, um, your mind, your, your emotions, everything like that. Um, and I suppose the first thing is to sort of describe what I consider to be the default um, psychological state. Um, our brain, if, if you are like 99% of the population, um, somebody who, who thinks that they are their brain, they, they are their thoughts, um, um, then the brain is programmed to avoid danger. So it's constantly analysing and um, if it thinks that things and situations are dangerous, then that manifests in anxiety, in worries, in fears. Um, and if you don't have all the answers, if you are in a worrying, worrying place, then, um, then that turns into sort of chronic anxiety and you can soon become quite overwhelmed. And um, when I got into Olorua, which was the island that I was, um, I was um, marooned on for 60 days, um, my, I thought I would start getting lonely after about, um, after about a week. And what I realised is I was utterly overwhelmed. And, immediately I got dropped off by the boat. There were so many thoughts, there were so many fears, there were so many worries, and, um, and it just, it almost made, incapacitized me, you know. I left, I was left feeling sort of dumb, and my brain was not working because, because it was overloaded, basically. Um, the double-edge sort of, um, what I think is a sort of default mode is that I then immediately started blaming. Um, now, on the island, it was wreckied in the rainy season, and I went on um, at the beginning of dry season, and there wasn't enough fresh water on the island. And so immediately I started defaulting into this mode, which was blame. Blame the production company for putting me in this ridiculous situation where there's not enough water. So I was having to drink coconut water because there wasn't a fresh water supply that was running on the island. I eventually sort of wicked a bit of fresh water away from a rock and made this sort of a system whereby I got one drip of fresh water every 40 seconds, but that was my water supply, <laughs> one drip of water every 40 seconds. Um, so I got about two litres of water, no, about one litre of water actually a day from that and then had to supplement it by, um, by um, coconut water. But my point being is um, the blaming the production company didn't help me at all. And I think one of the things that I would advocate is taking responsibility of your situation, even in, in a situation where you feel like you have done nothing to to cause it, like, for example, lockdown, blaming the government, blaming the law, blaming the Chinese, none of these things are going to help at all. Um, and, and I think if you put yourself in a situation where your happiness is dependent on something else changing, then you, you've completely lost your, um, lost your ability to make yourself um, happy or to put yourself in a good, peaceful state. So I would say taking responsibility for everything is so, so, so important. Um, a couple of other little tricks, and I think there are these, these little tricks, I think, for me, are only the very foothills of psychology, and I think can be usurped by what I'm about to talk about later. But one of the things I used to do was to advocate treating a situation like a game. So if you imagine, one of the reasons your people can get overwhelmed by a situation is because the consequences of not doing well, especially if it's a life-threatening situation, are you die. Now, that's such an overwhelming consequence that it can then again cause you to freeze. Now, treating it like a game sounds flippant, but the thing is, when you play a game, you still want to win, you're still alert, you're still attuned to all of the different things that you need to do in order to survive. But, because the consequences aren't that you'll physically die, you've not got those worries going on, so you're not overwhelmed by it. So you're in the perfect um, positive, proactive state in order to actually change your situation. Logging little wins as well is, a, is, is one thing that I would say is a good thing. So you go down to a stream in the morning and you get some water, recognising that you've actually done a quarter of, of, of the physical, so you've, you've, you've provided yourself with a quarter of the physical survival needs. You've, you've drank water to give yourself a little pat on the back. 
Um, <clears throat> I think that's really important because unless you're telling yourself that you're winning and that, and that you're um, in a good position, then nobody else is going to do that for you. And so it's important to step in if, if you are doing this type of, what I'm sort of positive self-talk, I suppose. Um, there's a sort of cliche, which is the, the difference between an ordeal and adventure is attitude. Um, and I do massively um, agree with this. The problem is it's quite difficult to say, well, that's, that's all well and good, isn't it? But um, how do I change my attitude? Um, what I'm going through is an ordeal. Um, and one of the signals, I suppose, that I use to work out whether for, the, for me something is becoming an ordeal rather than an attitude is sense of humour. If I've lost my sense of humour, which I do <laughs> on countless occasions, I do lose my sense of humour, then, then I, that's an alarm bell for me that things are, have become a little bit overwhelming, that I need to do something about that. Um, one story I've got is actually way back in my past from when I was training to become an um, a infantry officer. And um, they, you had um, training exercises where you were given a command position. So you might, for example, be made platoon commander or uh, platoon sergeant, and they carry responsibility. And while you have that position, you're being analysed by the directing staff, the DS, if you watch um, Who Dares Wins or any of that sort of um, um, TV. Now, the... <coughs> Now, the th what I used to do, and which is why I didn't perform very well, was I used to fear being put in a command position. I used to think, oh, no, if it happens to me, I'm not sure I've got all the answers, I'm not sure I'm good enough, et cetera, et cetera. And so if I was then made um, a platoon commander, for example, then I would start flapping and, and I would be in that negative state where I was over-analyzing everything, and again, I'd get overwhelmed, and, and, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't perform well. And what I worked out, <clears throat> which was just layman really stuff, but if I changed my psychology, so when we were put in three sides of a square, and the DS was handing out the, the, the um, command positions, I would just say to myself, I want this, I want this, I want platoon commander, I want platoon sergeant, so that I was, I was taking a conscious decision that this is something that I want, so it wasn't being put on me, it wasn't a burden, it wasn't something that I was dreading, it was something that I was actively seeking in order to change the, the, my, my attitude towards it. And I think that, that did help massively, actually. I think it's a, it's a nice little tip. Um, <clears throat> that said, all of these things are quite hard work. If you are working off the basis of trying to keep positive, keeping negative thoughts at bay is, is harder than you think. And, and if you are working off taking pleasures in life's little wins, then when life goes wrong, you can't, um, you can't blame yourself if you then have lows as well. So if, if, you're, if you're taking pleasure in getting the water, but then you can't light a fire later, then you're gonna have these roller coaster ups and downs. And it's not that sustainable, and it's not that, um, it's not that balanced either. You end up, um, again, when I spoke to some of the editors um, when they edited Naked and Maroon, which is the 60 days on the island, they said it was very difficult to, to edit together because you had such extraordinary highs and such, such low lows in such a small period of time. And they actually had to group the lows together and group the highs together to make scenes because otherwise the audience was just not going to be able to follow the whole thing. So one of the things that I didn't know about then that I latterly um, did get introduced to was mindfulness. Um, and that's the second part of the psychology um, bit that I just wanted to go into. Um, <clears throat> your mind obviously is working all the time. Um, and if you believe that you are your mind, you get caught up in it and every single thought, every single desire, every single um, anxiety, and you'll kind of get taken along for the ride. Um, <clears throat> the biggest thing that I would, um, I suppose one of the anecdotes that, to make this, um, to, to, make, to, to sort of draw out the sort of default mind is um, when I was on the island, there were waves crashing on the beach, but there were also waves crashing on the reef. And they were out of sync with each other. They'd go, ksh, 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 ksh. and there was white noise essentially the whole time. And my brain decided to um, make up music to kind of process this noise. It was sort of overloaded with this, this very, very, um, very, very loud, but also out of sync um, white noise. And it would make up songs. And initially, um, it was for, for, for some reason, um, the song was to the tune of uh, Land of Hope and Glory, but it was. Lloyd George knew my father. I got no idea why. The most annoying thing. And at, at first I was like, okay, my brain's just doing that in order to, um, to cope with this information. And then I got annoyed with it and I wanted it to, to stop and I couldn't get it to stop. And at that point I was like, well, 
I'm creating it and I want it to stop, am I going mad? You know, and, and that happened on various occasions where I would have conflicting thoughts. And um, I would argue that that was because I didn't understand about the autonomy of the way the brain works. Um, one of the pe some of the people that I have got the best advice off in, in my whole life have been Aboriginal Australians, and um, particularly a guy called Jeremy Donovan, who's an extraordinary healer and didgeridoo player, um, has got a, a phenomenal story if you want to look him up on, on YouTube. He's extraordinary. But he, um, he taught me about the Aboriginal belief of having three brains, essentially. And your biggest brain um, is, your, is your gut and your instinct. That's called Gumbalunya. Um, your second biggest brain is your heart, your emotions, that's called Gupanyang. And the small, smallest brain, which is the logical brain that a lot of Westerners believe that are them, is called Nandupuru. And Nandupuru is also the word that Aboriginal Australians use for um, a fishing net that is tangled beyond, beyond repair, completely um, messed up, basically. And that tangled beyond repair word is also used for the logical human brain. So he just explained to me, look, if you, if you believe that you are your thoughts and your, emo and, uh, your thoughts, then you're, you're living your life in this constant tangled state of, um, of anxiety and fear and worries. And going on to the island, you're going to struggle massively. So he tried to get me from, get, get, come from this instinctive place. And scientifically, there's all sorts of things that now back this up. Um, apparently, over 80% of the the body's serotonin, which is um, obviously the chemical that makes you feel good, is produced in the gut. It's not produced in the head at all, it's produced in the gut. And so far from it, I think, being just a, a way of looking at yourself, I believe that um, Aboriginal, have a, Aboriginal Australians have a huge um, wisdom that I think um, science hasn't yet caught up with personally. That's, that's my belief. Um, and so I do now try and live from a far more instinctive place. And th their belief is that, you know, the way you live your life, your thoughts, your, your, your decisions should, should come from the gut. They should then be filtered through the heart and the emotions in order to, um, in order to work out what's right or wrong or you know, um, whether you like it or not. But then it should be filtered through the logical brain as well. But the logical brain is just a tool. It isn't who you are. Um, and I think that's the big mistake is when you think that you are every single thought in your brain that's when people start going mad. That's when people start crumbling as well. That's when people start having really dodgy thoughts and, and getting depressed as well. And I've had my fair share of um, depression in my life, and it has always been when I've been what I call heady or in my head. And I think trying to come from a more deeper place is massively important. So how do you do that? Um, personally, I have a, I have a uh, meditation practice. I, I, um, I do a little app, which I'm not um, paid to advocate, but it's called Headspace. And it's been one of the biggest life changes for me to be able to step back from your thoughts and emotions, see the autonomous, autonomous thoughts popping away and pinging away and not getting engaged in them, not running after them, not, um, not getting caught up in them, I suppose, has been extraordinarily freeing. Um, <coughs> um, if you bring it back to lockdown, um, again, it's not really a lockdown story, but it's a, it's a, um, it's a little story from Walking the Amazon, actually. When we were walking, and, and there were parts of the walk that we were walking where we ran out of food completely. Um, and so there were long periods where I was extraordinarily hungry. And I would go into my hammock at night, and because um, we hadn't had any food and we knew we wouldn't have any food tomorrow, I would, I would get into my hammock thinking about food all the time, thinking about all the food that I hadn't got. And for some reason, Mr. Kipling's French fancies were the things that I kept, were, were in my head all the time. And... Um, and sometimes it would keep me awake all night long. I'd just lie in bed thinking about food. Um, and then, you know, when you, 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 um, you can hear the birds calling and, and the light starts to change and you haven't slept at all. So this was massively impacting my life and the fact that I, I then get to the morning and I was, I was, I was in a state and I was, I was kind of panicky because I'd just been thinking about something that I have no control over and that I can't have. Cho had this... Um, saying which was quando i i quando no i no i and, and um, if you translate that literally it means when you have you have and when you haven't you haven't which at first i thought was really annoyingly simple but he um he told me the backstory and when he was about 10 or 11 uh, the shining path of communist guerrilla movement swept through his part of peru and he had to escape up into the mountains on his own so his mother and father were down where all the gunshots and the explosions were in the town and he lived up in the, uh, in the up in the hills in the mountains and his little expression, when you have, you have, and when you haven't, you haven't, 
was his little zen-like um, way of, of basically telling himself there's no point in focusing on what you've not got. You might as well focus on, you might as well just completely accept the current situation and then you can move forward positively because you're not obsessing about things you haven't got any control over. And he came up with that as, a, as an 11 year old, um, which I think is quite extraordinary and I, I use it to, to live my life by. And if the, I'm going to read out an Eckhart Tolle um, um, phrase, which is, um, when you accept what is, every moment is the best moment. That is enlightenment. And that's um, Eckhart Tolle, or Eckhart Tolle, I don't know how you pronounce his surname. But um, I think that's a, massive, um, a massively important thing. Um, I find that when I am getting, I'm struggling during lockdown, it's because I'm wanting stuff to be different. I'm, I'm wanting lockdown to finish. I'm wanting um, a regular in income again. I'm wanting uh, to pay the mortgage. Um, I'm, I'm wanting the stresses to go away. And I think one of the really, really important things to, to, to combat that, that we can all do, is just accepting everything the way it is, taking responsibility for our life now, and then, and then just doing little incremental things that are positive to help us, like, um, um, I don't know, anything from doing the washing up to going outside to, to, um, to trying to look at alternate sources of income to um, all sorts of little positive things that you could do to make your personal situation better. And I think that, that then puts you in a better state. That's, that's, that's my take on it anyway. It is now 10.41, so I'm going uh, to wind up um, because I think that's, um, that's probably enough waffling from me. But um, I would go back to the to the thing that I mentioned earlier, which was um, one of the one of the biggest realizations that my wife and and I and, and our little boy Ran um, had when we did our six uh, when I when we did a month on an island. The three of us was um, things are never um, as happy when you haven't got all the, uh, all of the um, community around you. And so the one thing that has been taken away from us at the moment is is community, and we get a little doses of it online and Zoom calls and. And, and, and Skype and all of that, but it's not the same. It's not the same as um, if you're the sort of person who goes to the pub, going to the pub and chatting to mates, and it therefore means that we're not thriving at the moment. Even though we're doing all of these little things, even though we've got around the people probably that we love the most in the world, it's, it's understandable that we're not all thriving because we haven't got that sense of community in the same way that we normally have. So go easy on yourself, I would therefore say. Right, let's, let's um, call that a day. And ask, ask some, um, answer some of these questions that are coming in now, right? Would you recommend walking the Amazon book for improving cyber survival skills? Nah, not really for survival skills, but it's a good, it's a good um, <laughs> if I say so myself, it's a good book for um, learning through somebody else's mistakes. Um, I didn't, I, I, had, I, think, I think, you know, when you constantly put yourself in situations where you don't have the answers, that's where you grow, that's where you learn. And walking the Amazon was that in bucket loads. And so if you want to learn from my mistakes <laughs> time and time again, then yeah, it's a great book. Um, we just need to completely accept what life throws us is and it will all be okay. Well, I mean, I do believe in that, yeah. And I, d I think acceptance can sometimes, and the word surrender, surrender to the flow of life can often be misunderstood. That doesn't mean a sort of resigned, oh, well, in that case, I'll just lie down and let everything happen to me in a, in a really apathetic manner. That's not what I'm talking about at all. Acceptance is, um, again, to use an Eckhart Tolle story, uh, imagine you're stuck in the mud and um, you resign yourself or you surrender yourself to the fact that you are stuck in the mud because you are stuck in the mud. So you might as well accept it. And then, once you, rather than frustratedly thinking and getting angry and thinking, I shouldn't be in the mud, but, but you are, so that's wasted energy. You accept it, completely accept your situ current situation, but then walk to work towards getting yourself out of the mud. But hopefully, when you're working towards that, you're in a better state. You're in a more positive, proactive state rather than a, an angry one. <clears throat> How do you teach your kid mindfulness? Um, this, is, this is a very good one. Um, <clears throat> I don't actively at the moment. I, I, I suppose part of mindfulness is being present, isn't it? And doing healthy stuff outdoors for me is, a, is the best way to make Ran present. If I leave him in front of the TV um, and he gets absorbed in something digital like that and a screen or, or if I don't um, engage him and he's just getting bored and disruptive, um, then he's not his best self. But if I'm taking him outdoors, he's got, you know, you can feel the the cold air of outdoors on his, on his skin and he's actually engaging in nature. I think that's one of the best ways to teach kids mindfulness, it, although it is extraordinarily difficult to, as a concept to explain, but I think, um, I think 
you know, the stuff that we're doing, engaging in the outdoors, forces you to be present. And when, when you are 100% present in what you're doing, that is meditation really, isn't it? Because you're not thinking about the future or worried about the past. You're just utterly engaged. And I think that's a healthy state to be in. Um, <clears throat> do, do, do. Gary Marlow, that was from that question was from. It sounds a little bit like Gary Barlow, doesn't it? Um, but not quite. Um, logical brain is not important. Move on. Um, that was from Diana. Um, logical brain, of course, is important, but it's just I don't personally believe it's who we are. It's a tool, um, and it can get us in a in a right state. Um, Edward Ridgeway, uh, you've already read that one out. Thank you for sharing. Very helpful to get us through this nightmare around the world. Yes. Um, or this adventure that we're all on, <laughs> you know? It's, it's the way we frame things. I mean, crikey, it sounds silly, doesn't it? But I mean, even if I'm going to do a, a public talk, uh, if someone says to me, are you nervous? I'll just say, I'm excited. I am so excited about this. Because if you think about it, ner nerves and excitement are they're the almost exactly the same feeling in your body. And if you say I'm excited, that's positive. You can't wait to do it. If you say you're nervous, it's negative, and you don't want to do it. And I think, again, it, so much is um, is influenced by um, the way we the way we view things. <coughs> uh, da, da, da. Okay. Well, I'm really glad that everyone's been tuning in. There's lots of people just saying hello, hi. Um, good. Um, so on Friday, I will be um, going into um, more stuff surrounding fire. I'm going to have a look, play around with different methods of, of lighting fires, alternative to, um, to matches and alternative to lighters. Um, I'll go in a little bit more depth about the hand drill because it's, um, you know, just two bits of wood. Lighting a fire with two bits of wood is, is, um, is a nice skill to have. And it's not because you might have to do it one day. It's, it's that whole thing of engaging in nature and, and therefore being more confident in nature because you know that you can go um, you can go outdoors and if you do drop your lighter in a in the in a puddle or you do get your matches wet that you you're equipped with the skills that you know that you could you could cope you know and that and that is freeing it allows you to be more confident outdoors it allows you to be able to um, um, not be not be as worried I suppose which is a which is a really good thing. Um, so we're going we're gonna to go into that. And, um, and then on Monday, Stephen is back. I, I believe he'll be cooking. Um, so he'll be outside on his fire and doing some um, cooking over the fire, but that's not until Monday. So thank you very much for tuning in. Got lots of people saying thanks. Um, and um, and that, that was interesting. Um, I hope it was. Please, please uh, do uh, message me on Facebook or Instagram or you know, if, if that was a little bit too spiely and you want more practical lessons, then please let me know. It's always useful to have feedback because then we can we can direct these in a, in a better way. But that was um, if you didn't like it, that was um, you can blame it on Ben Fogel because uh, that was his suggestion for today. <laughs> All right. I'll end on that um, very, very critical note that completely undermines everything else that I said today. Thank you very much for tuning in, everyone. And um, I will see you on Friday. Dun, dun, dun.